we've kind of changed this on the fly, so um, we're actually going to talk about something that you're not used to the end at all. Uh, we've got, we uh, lost a couple of our panelists and added a couple of panelists, so this is, we, we can actually talk about this topic if you'd like. Um, we have a panel of either guys who have a lot of money, which would be three of those four, or, uh, <laughs> or, or guys who actually know what to do with, with money once you have it, which would be two of those four. Kevin, being fair. Sorry, Kevin, you're, you're out. Uh, we're going to talk about, um, we can talk about this as well, but we're, we plan to talk about what happens when you have a successful company and you want to start thinking about exit strategies, so how to actually monetize your company. And you know, among, among the strategies, you don't have to always sell your company. You can always do something you know, crazy like go public. So it's not like for a, a good example, a good topic, for example, Zynga is a private company that's about to go public. Probably they're not going to fire any of their employees. They're probably just going to all get nicer cars. So I mean, it's not going to really change what they do. Um, on the panel, we have David Adams, who is uh, Vice President of E-Commerce for GameStop. They have money, and they can spend it. Uh, we have Dan Offner from Loeb & Loeb. He's a partner. Uh, I can genuinely say that uh, Dan is the preeminent lawyer, uh, practicing lawyer in the games industry. So if you ever find yourself in need of legal counsel, probably for any reason, including games related. But no, if you need legal counsel for a divorce or something and you want to protect your company, Dan is a partner who will make sure that your, your, your greedy spouse doesn't get their hands on all those assets you've created. Um, and he actually, they do, they'll structure contracts, they will take care of just about anything you can think of. But, but again, M&A probably, capital raising is probably one of their bigger functions. Um, David Higley, a uh, close personal friend, um, who has been an investment banker, also a lawyer, but not, not practicing. Well, kind of practicing, not being a banker. Um, but has been an investment banker for at least a dozen years in the space, has done, I can't even count how many billions of dollars in capital raises for video game companies, um, has his own firm, Bond Lane Partners. Um, and again, if you're ever looking for money, David can help you find it, whether that is a capital raise or selling your company, or you know, pretty much all the way to and then Kevin Dent's the mobile guy. No, Kevin, Dent, uh, Kevin Dent is a uh, consultant. I, you know, I, Kevin, Kevin likes to say he's, he's an expert in all games, and probably true. Um, Kevin is probably better, best known for working with, with startups, private companies, helping them to obtain licenses, to get games to market, to find developers, to raise capital, to sell their companies. So um, kind of uh, analogous, I guess, and complementary to what David does. Um, I am just some ridiculously overpaid guy who is lucky to be here. Um, yeah, and I have, uh, I, I, all of my experience is on the public equity side. So if you're about to go public, I, I'm happy to talk to you. If you're at any other stage in your company's development, you probably want to talk to one of these guys. Um, I did not prepare an agenda. I think, I think what, what we'd like to uh, just, just broach the subject of what you know? What makes a company successful? You know, so I'd like each of these guys to talk about when they're looking at private game companies. You know, what kind of attributes are they looking for in a successful company? And that can be at any stage. And actually, I'd like to hear you guys talk about um, your recent experiences. So, so talk about the kinds of companies that you've dealt with recently. You know, give a couple examples. Um, actually, I'm going to start with Kevin because I've trashed him so bad. But you know, talk about. Like, who is good that you've worked with recently? What is it that they do that makes them good? And if you can, without betraying confidentiality, you know, where are they in kind of the capital requirements process? Where does their money come from? How do they raise money? And, and where do you see things going? And so, well, first and foremost, what I do, I'm an idiot in this sort of area. Uh, so my money is hired this guy. Uh, <laughs> I bet you my last two, uh, one of these industries where you can't really talk much about uh, the sort of numbers and things that are involved. I'm sure they, they would love to tell you or rank his NDAs, but uh, unfortunately I can't. Uh, well, you can afford it. So, uh, so I'd probably like to address it in just a slightly different way. Okay, when you need to talk to people like this. So you've, you've taken your company, you've gotten solid revenues, or you're at break even, 
Okay, then you, you call someone like me and say, okay, we need to go from break even to profitability. So I, I basically develop a, a strategy to bring your company uh, to a stage where they're actually attractive to investors or to a buyer. Okay, the best way to get bought, or the quickest way to get bought, is to say, I want to raise money. Because if anyone is interested in buying you at all, in any way, shape, or form, Okay, as soon as you say, I want to raise money, and they find out, they know it's going to be more expensive, expensive to buy you after that point uh, of uh, capital injection. And just to interject, PopCap is a great example of that. They were very loud about how they were planning to file to go public later this year. They were talking about filing around now to go public later in the year. And what do you know? The next thing, he is right in there sniffing around and offering what I consider to be an awful lot of money. I know a billion here and a billion there. So yeah. it's like real money. So that happens right for the, for the food check. It doesn't matter whether you're, you've got a $1 million uh, valuation, like you've got a gentleman here from Industry Gamers uh, who is the, you're from Industry Gamers, right? I'm not. He, looks like, he does look like James. He does. Does. But he's not. Okay, sorry. Let's pretend you are. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a gentleman here from Industry Gamers. <laughs> and they recently got sold to Europe Bank. And one of the, the cruxes behind that are, was that the rumor around the street was that they were looking to raise money. Okay, and once he started looking to raise money, people are going to be saying, okay, A, why are they raising money? B, okay, can we get them for cheap before uh, they actually get the capital injection? Okay, so, yeah. And then once you're at the stage of raising the money, like you don't go to this guy unless you look for, like, I think $10 million is a fair number. Yeah, yeah, so you don't go to this guy unless you look to raise $10 million plus, okay? And you're going into like triple league baseball at that stage. Okay? You're not quite at a major league baseball, but you're like solid triple A, okay? And then this guy comes in, and then it gets more intense, okay? Doing a, a, a B round of that, size or could be a C round of that size is an extremely intense uh, aspect. So another aspect of what I do is I try to put your feet on the ground. Okay? And that's basically saying to you, you suck. Okay? Until you exit and you've got the money, what I call uh, fuck you money, okay, you suck. So stop. You guys can look that up on Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so don't give up your business to stop running out. I think this is a nice segue because me and Dave, I know are on the same page in terms of don't stop running your business just because you're raising money. So, okay. so we, we have two Davids. Um, David, Sorry, David, Higley, David, Higley. David Higley, would you talk about um, just kind of which stages, talk about the stages of capital raising, so talk about angel investors and then VC, private equity, what does A, B, and C round mean? Because sure. Kevin, Kevin kind of referred to stuff like that and I want to make sure it works on the Well, page. yeah, and, and in the Capital raising, I mean, I think one of the reasons why you do see, um, you know, a lot of times sales happen when people are raising money is if you're selling part or all of your stock, you're selling part of your company. And at that time, that's just an event where you, you know, it's an appropriate time to kind of look at options, and I think it's, it, it makes sense. You know, there's a, what, what you are seeing right now, and, and I, I would say there's a little bit of a bifurcation of the market, um, where there's a very robust angel market and there's a very robust later stage market kind of the middle is pretty choppy right now um, still and, and there's some dynamics going on because you know the economy is, is not turned um, it's stabilized but it hasn't turned LPs are still locked in a lot of these kind of I would say the B rounds can tend, tend to be a B rounds or really a because if you take angel as kind of pre a those tend to be very difficult so Angel, you know, you have an idea, you want to get some money, um, particularly where we are now, because, you know, if you look at casual games, the, the cost to, to make a game is not like a console or a frontline game. Uh, there is capital around that. I think also there's a lot of interest and stuff in that area. You go to the next phase, which is, you know, you've got out the game, you've got a little traction, but you really want to kind of throttle down and put more money in. Um, right now, there are just a ton of companies out there that, you know, hey, we've made a good game, but we just don't have traction. And, and that's a very difficult position to be in. Um, and that's kind of, I think, if you can kind of break through that and, and you do get the capital, then you go to the next thing, which is really the B, 
or later. And, and profitable companies uh, looking for growth capital, I, I think raising capital right now is, is, is quite good. Uh, good ideas um, are always fundable. And then right in the middle, where you've kind of proven out, but you haven't, you, you, you've proven concept, but you haven't proven out your success, um, it's pretty hard. And that would be what I would say right in the middle. So, you know, angel, middle, and later stage. Dan? Um, so, uh, give you a bit of background and then what I, what I see out there as sort of people who are successful and are doing. Uh, I've been practicing in the IP game space, I guess, almost over 20 years, 20 years plus. And uh, half of what I do is corporate. Um, and it is both with capital formation and raising capital and then also exiting. Um, most of the exits that I have done have always been uh, either um, sales to public companies or, or private sales. Um, although the firm I'm at does a lot of IPO work. We represent uh, 50 or 60 companies now out of China which have gone public on the US markets. Um, and um, often in my role, I've been an outside GC. I functioned in that role for THQ for many years when they scaled from about 30 million to 300 million and then functioned as Ubisoft's North American GC as they built a footprint here. And I was really their outside GC here in North America. Um, uh, several years ago, I took my small shop and migrated it over to a large full service firm because we were competing with the likes of Wilson Sonsini and Perkins Cooley and Davis Wright and Tremaine uh, on, these, on exactly these types of deals and we needed more firepower. About a year and a half ago, I was recruited at Loeb & Loeb to come over and build out their video game practice and uh, scale that business. And at Loeb, we, we sort of break the business into a couple of different buckets and this will come to the types of clients that we see as successful. Um, we have what we call sort of the transactional bucket, where it could be anything from acquiring uh, rights to make a game, content rights, so you can make a game like Plants vs. Zombies, or technology, could be doing a, a Unity license, which really isn't very much, or another type of uh, technology license that you need to make your casual or social or mobile game. Um, or it could be a straight development agreement, or it could be a host of online distribution agreements. We have the corporate services area, and then we really have IP, which can be anything from offense or defense on patents, or dealing with patent litigation, or trademark analysis and prosecution. Uh, and then we also have everybody's favorite, which is litigation. So the beauty of Loeb & Loeb is that they get entertainment and they get digital. We represent people like Google and Yahoo and Netflix and others, all of whom are creating a digital highway Ramp. And when I came over to Loeb, one of the things they had promised, which I didn't really believe, was that they had institutional clients that wanted to be in the game space, but also in the digital space. And I was kind of suspect because I'd heard that pitch before. And it's true. So we've been doing work for firm clients, and I'll, I'll pick Netflix as one which decided not to set up a games pipeline at this point. Um, I think the ingredients for success and having been through a brief process with Netflix on their decision not to go into games at this point um, and to really pursue their digital streaming strategy is that you see people who are acutely focused on timing and what the market is doing and what they're bringing to the market at that time. They're acutely focused on execution and they, they work really, really hard. Um, and they're unafraid to take risk and go where people, people think they should go. At this point, we have another client that I can't mention that is sort of in the ether at this show. And they're very, very acutely focused on what I would call the end user and the consumer and how to monetize that consumer uh, both at traditional retail, but also in the digital, social, and casual space. I think they're going to make some big bets. I think they're going to take some real risks. I think they're going to execute really well. Um, 
But I think they're going to do some things that are unconventional, and and run against run against the run against the tide. And if I, I I go back to the public decision that Netflix has made, they're not going they're not going to take their how many millions of subscribers? Well, 25 before they raised price, so right. probably 22 now. Drop. 22 million subscribers and drop a social digital games channel in there which a bunch of publishers, a bunch of people have asked them to do. They've said, we're not scaled to do that, we don't like it, but what we're, we're, we are going to focus on is expanding to, you know, internationally and also our streaming business, because even though we're going to change our pricing model, we're sticky enough, we're going to keep those people at the higher price. So if I have advice for people out there as they need the services of Kevin or David Higley, it's really think about the timing. I know you all will work hard and don't be afraid to be a contrarian. David? You know, I, I would probably double down on some of those comments around time and execution, but I'm, I'm looking around, I'm seeing that, I'm gonna assume most of the audience are guys that are kind of independent gamers. I mean, that's the, the, the you know, the organization. And we, we should get a show of hands who's out there. Who's, a, who's actually like an independent game developer that's in the audience? Okay. Okay, well, you know, about half, maybe a little more. So it's interesting for me, my role at GameStop um, for the last year and a half, I've actually spent a good amount of time looking at companies from primarily technology perspective, but also energy perspective, as possible acquisition targets as part of our overall digital strategy. So for some of you who might not be aware, GameStop has been making an aggressive expansion of our capabilities, moving into digital distribution, digital sales, uh, new channels for online gaming, streaming, uh, digital downloads, things that are kind of uh, incremental to our traditional brick and mortar, uh, you know, business focused on on console titles primarily. Um, and but prior to working at GameStop, I actually was on the other side of the table. So a few years ago, I actually had a small development studio that was, you know, also looking to be acquired. So for me, it's been an interesting inflection because I now sitting on this side of the table can see both what I did wrong in, the, in my pursuit of a, an acquisition or exit opportunity, and what has gone right for at least three of the companies that we successfully acquired. Um, definitely timing was a strong aspect of a successful acquisition. You know, the, um, the, the need for a potential buyer or investor um, usually falls within a window, and normally that's projecting along some sort of marketplace phenomenon, whether it be social gaming, mobile gaming, you know, whether it be shareware or digital distribution, and you know, having a strong, having strong capabilities in the more relevant uh, kind of trends of the day definitely increases your likelihood of finding a suit. Um, now, on the other hand, all the acquisitions that we have executed have been of firms of 30 folks or less. So these are definitely organizations that are not in the, the Netflix kind of or even Hopcat kind of level, um, they, are, they are more probably tuned to a lot of the organizational sizes that are here, where you're looking at 10 to 20 man teams, and you can actually navigate a successful exit at that size. But you know, in addition to having the timing and execution uh, kind of focus, I did notice that a lot of the firms were also very flexible. So there's a need when you're actually going to kind of incorporate into a large entity, in our case, like you know, we're acquiring companies to be part of our digital strategy, for you not just to fill one role, but also be able to morph somewhat to be able to fill sometimes multiple roles. And it was the ability for those organizations to execute, as well as their kind of knowledge of the space, ability to transform in some ways, that was really attractive for GameStop. So case in point would be our last acquisition, which was a company called Spawn Labs in, in Austin. This is a company that was actually focused, their, their product was a sling box for video games. And they pivoted to become a competitive streaming option. So now they're, they're competing with online and icon. So this, is, this was something where they recognized what we can demonstrate that we've been able to execute on a budget and you know, within our own kind of, you know, within our own means, within one model, but we can also show how we could be a bigger player in an emerging trend, and this is how we can make the narrative bridge the gap between A and B. And I think that that was something, as you're, you're looking at a small studio and a gaming, you're probably going to be focused on your primary 
you know, line of business, primary product, primary capabilities, but always thinking, what is adjacent to me that's interesting, that actually might be something where there are better opportunities for me to actually find a suitor if I'm looking for an exit strategy or something to serve. So the younger and far better looking David just brought up a really interesting point. Um, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> talking, talking, uh, talking about uh, what, what makes a successful acquisition. And I think it's interesting because he comes from you know, the perspective of an acquirer. So you know, I think you should think about all capital raises as zero sum, okay? So yes, there are outcomes where you can do fine, you come out a winner, and the person who's funding you comes out a winner. But more often than not, one of you comes out a little better than the other. And I think one of the reasons that we constructed this panel this way, it kind of went this way, and it's really not an advertisement because I, I doubt anybody's ready to go public. I don't think I'm getting any business out of this at all. Um, but if you watch Curb Your Enthusiasm, uh, I did not see it last night, but a week ago, you know, Larry fired his divorce lawyer and hired some guy he met in a restaurant, and next thing you knew, he lost everything. You know, that's what happens if you pick a bad, bad person to represent you. If you pick nobody to represent you, which I would say is probably true of all of GameStop's acquisitions, everybody they've acquired has been unrepresented, it's always a successful acquisition for GameStop. And again, no, no diss to you guys, I mean, more power to you. Um, go look at all the acquisitions EA's made and Zynga's made and how many of those people had representation. Almost never. Yes. So, so, I mean, occasionally. But, but it's, you know, the, the, the acquirers would vastly prefer to deal with unsophisticated sellers and tell that they want to tell you what you're worth. These guys will help you appreciate what your worth is. I think it's like selling your own house or selling yeah, your business. I'd like to speak yeah, no, please. I want, no, I'd like you guys all to speak. That. So, so I'd like to hear. I'd like to hear your perspective on what you add in value. What exactly do you do that adds value? So I, I'm going to joke about what lawyers add as value. You know, net negative, but. <laughs> um, 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 you know, most lawyers are viewed as deal killers, and et cetera, but I want to speak to that um, because most people show up with me when in this, in this segment, and this was one reason why we talked about sort of changing the topic to this, and I wanted to dwell on this, and a little bit of a setup for these two guys and critique for him, but most people show up and they have a deal to be done. And they're, they're waving a term sheet at me, or an LOI. And they say, you know, I've been approached, and I'm going to pick on Zynga, because I can. I've been approached by Zynga, Z, Zebra. Uh, and I've got a deal. What do you want to do? And what do you think I ought to do? And my reaction is, well, did you ever want to sell your company? Oh, yeah, yeah, I think I did. But I wasn't sure I wanted to do it this year. That's when you want to pull out your hair. Because if you have any idea that at some point you want to sell this company and you're starting to execute and you're either going to raise a slug of capital and then you're going to sell in 12 to 18 to 36 to 24 months, then that's got to be factored in into your fundamental strategic business plan and your tactical operational plan. And you begin, better begin a dialogue with some sophisticated business development consultants and you better make sure that your legal structure is set up to handle that at the front end, not on the back end, that you're cleaning up some freaking messed up California corporation that should have been a Delaware corporation at the beginning or someone at Perkins Coie, I'll pick on them because they're not here. Not, I won't pick on Reed Smith. Someone at Perkins Coie set you up as a Washington State corporation because there's no income tax but in Washington the, State. The, the other best lawyer in the video game industry is, is, is over there, it's Patrick well. Sweeney. I mentioned there were two. There. Right, that's okay. my old colleague and partner from, from Nixon. He's now over at Reed Smith. But I mean, you want to make sure you're in legal infrastructure, but even more importantly, and I'm going to kick it over to these two guys, you've started to have a dialogue with a banker such as David Higley, or preferably David or Kevin, to begin to think about what valuation do I want to get? How do I get there? What capital needs do I need? How can I exit? How do companies like this exit? What are, I mean, these are all questions, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna shut up, but you know, when is the best time, guys, for someone to come and see you in the process? Well, I, I think it's the same thing with a lawyer. The earlier, the better. I mean, you, you got a view, and, and, a, and the other thing is, it, it is, if you use the analogy of selling your house, or, or I, I actually use this, and maybe this describes bankers, but it, going in to buy a car, 
You know, you may buy eight cars in your life if you're active, where a guy will come in and sell eight a day. You may be just that good that you can always do a great job, but odds are the guy on the other side who is just a real salesperson, that's what he does, is probably gonna know the game a little bit better. Um, and I think M&A can be like that. Um, I think there's a couple things that I've found is, you know, the check's in the mail, I love you, and hey, this is just gonna be a quick deal. Um, I've, been, I've been doing this for almost 20 years, and, and I'm still waiting for that quick, easy deal. It's a lot of work, it always is. Um, I think depending on where you are, it's, it's easy, if it's larger deals, ironically, are easier deals because you can look at traditional metrics for valuation. Smaller deals are actually more, I would say, hand-to-hand -hand combat because you have to be a strategic fit and get the buy-in from the business unit, and then you have to go and work the transactional guys who their job is to get the best deal. And that makes it a complex situation. The other thing, and this has happened, is it's not just price. And um, I would say this is from pretty much anywhere in the private where there's structure. In an IPO, generally, everything is common stock. It's, it's fairly transparent in structure. But in private deals and capital arrays and in M&A, it's not just price, it's structure. And most buyers, and I've been on the buy side, if, if you said to me on the buy side, you can control, I'll give you structure if you give me price, I'll give you a price. I'll give you whatever price you want because I can structure it to get whatever I need. And, and so you do see some of these deals and keep that in mind is there's a lot of these deals that get announced and it's a great sound bite of this price or that price. What ends up actually getting paid is fundamentally different. And I've seen this in, I've seen pitch books from bulge bracket investment banks where they look and they have evaluation metrics on a company, multiple companies, you look and go, but they actually got paid half of and let me, let me give you an example. The PopCap deal last week is $750 million up front, so six fifty dollars cash and 100 stock. The earn out of $550 million requires PopCap to deliver $343 million in profit combined in 2012 and 2013. They made $16 million last year. So they have to go from 16 to an average of 172. And I, you know, maybe they can do it. And I, the guys that run PopCap are sophisticated, bright guys. I think they know what they sign. But that's a tenfold increase in profit in two years. So yeah. impressive, you know, and if it happens, EA got a great deal and PopCap got a great deal. But if it doesn't happen, one or the other, I didn't benefit. And, and the thing is, you can't be an entrepreneur if you're not an optimist. So keep that in mind, too, because as a buyer, I know that you're going to put out numbers and you're going to say, I'm going to do this. You're going to believe it. You're going to have conviction, you know, rally the troops. And as a buyer, I can go, you know what? If you hit that, that's great. We'll all be happy. Um, so I think that's one thing. Uh, the other thing that I, I think people miss out on is fundamentally what drives valuation. And I think it's having the perspective. I think if you only do M&A, you're missing out on what drives markets, which is generally the, the public equity market. It's the most efficient way to look at markets. Transaction comps don't mean anything because it's a moment of time. and what's a, It's what a given buyer will pay a given seller at a certain period of time. YouTube was valued at what Google was going to pay, not what other companies would pay for companies like YouTube. And you saw that. Um, I think that this is something that's you know fundamental and it's something you just have to be aware of too. So there's two aspects. Okay, there's the, one of the reasons why I started the company was the lot of developers. They, they come along and say, my artist worked on Grand Theft Auto 4, my sound guy won like 10, 10 awards, they have DICE awards, great, okay? But like over the last 10 years, I've seen studios be bought, and I've said, wow, they got bought for that much, and their, their games aren't that, even that good, you know? Very average games. So I couldn't figure it out. Then a few, about six years ago, I figured it out. Okay, they had a solid business guy in the company. Okay, that would be at every conference saying, we're doing this, we're doing that, while studios that were amazing. Uh, like EA is on a, on a roll at the moment. Like PopCap is one of my favorite hybrid studios. They bought Shilingo, which is one of the best iOS distribution uh, firms in the world today, hands down. And from what I've heard, they got it for a great deal. Uh, the guy 
guys at Firemint, arguably one of the best iOS studios in the world. Okay. So all of these guys, they had solid business guys work with them. They had solid lawyers. So the first thing you do if you want to sell your company or have a business, okay, is you get a lawyer. Okay, and he's your first call when you get a cease and desist, uh, an interest from a buyer, then you get yourself a banker if you've got an interest in, in, or someone interested in buying or investing in your company. Okay, these are two fundamentals. Okay, there's so many studios out there that say, oh yeah, yeah, you're gonna buy us. Yeah, you'll come along and I'll give you the unfiltered truth. Yeah, you will come along, they'll kick the tires, they'll open your books, look at your books, look at your tech, go off, say, is it cheaper to buy or is it cheaper to build? build. Okay? And very few cases, okay, like look at it, how many corp dev guys they have, okay, versus how many acquisitions they make. Activision is the same, Microsoft the same. Just don't distract yourself from that. Hire a banker. On top of that, you're gonna have to have very, very terse conversations. Okay? The corp dev guy on the buy side, his job isn't to be your friend. His job is to screw you with your pants on as badly as possible. Okay? And your job is to screw him as badly as possible. Okay? You want to get as much money into your bank account as possible. He wants to give you as less money as possible. Okay? He'll say, I value your company at 100 million. You'll say, okay, that's interesting. And he'll say, you say, but I want 150. He'll say, I'll give you 150, but 75 is going to be paper. Okay, paper is fine. Okay, but if you're selling to a company that had whose paper stock, by the way, I'm talking about, is going like this, what do you use as paper? Okay, It'll keep you warm at night because you'd be able to burn your stock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, but that's that's where it begins and ends. Okay. Next part is you're going to have someone on the product side, okay, like like David, okay, that you're going to have to work with, okay, and sometimes negotiations aren't friendly affairs. You know, you try to be cordial, you try to be nice, so, but you're going to want like him or him, okay, that are going to have the tough conversation, so you can have a, a working relationship with David once the transaction is over. Would, would you agree with that? I agree. I mean, I think the process is out. My, it doesn't have to be as adversarial as yeah. you described, but I mean, ah. at a, it, it doesn't have to be, but you, likely it is. I yeah. mean, at a core, it is an adversarial process yeah. that says, you know, when you're coming to the deal table, everyone's representing their interests, yeah. and, you know, they're not looking out for the, the interest of the person on the side of the table. Yeah. That's, that's their role, yeah. right? Um, but then you have to recognize at the end of that adversarial process, there has to be that you typically, there is some element that says our interests are aligned. And that you know, it's that this cannot be a damaged relationship. Yeah. So we have to be able to exit from that, you know, in, in a way that can execute that that serves both needs. Yeah. Um, and I think that you know, we've had all the all the companies we've acquired have had representation. Some very much professional, traditional VC style representation. Some you know, local kind of non real deal oriented, but still you know, competent comp counsel and, and business advisors. I think that, you know, in the end... Sorry, can I just have one yeah, quick ahead. note? Okay, when I say lawyer, I mean a lawyer, like someone like uh, Pat Sweeney or Dan Offer. Okay, I'm not talking about the guy that did your father's bill. Right, right, right. Okay, right, 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 and right, I've right. heard that's, that. That's the curve your enthusiasm. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously, I've heard that five yeah. times in the last two weeks. Oh, yeah, I've got a lawyer. I don't need a lawyer. And I'm like, who's your lawyer? And he goes, oh, my dad, guy that did my father's bill or probate or whatever. Okay, use a game lawyer. You call the plumber when you've got water problems, electricity. Electrician, when you've got electrical, electrical problems, it's the same thing. Lawyers have different professions. But it, you know, and I think that it's, it's great that you underscored that because it underscores the commitment that has to be made to the process. Yeah. You know, you, it's not to actually go through, to position yourself for, and to transact a deal is not cheap. Yeah. You know, so um, one of your earlier points about executing through that is really critical because there are no guarantees that process will ex successfully. You know, and that's even if you get the best representation, you know, on your side. So, you know, Matt, I won't say that most, but many deals will not close successfully. So I think that, you know, there's that part of the challenge for a smaller firm is you can't tread lightly into that decision. You know, it's going to require a significant investment if you haven't actually prepared your books and had, you know, you know, an accumulated kind of plan 
you know, a longer plan for actually moving towards acquisition, there could be a lot of catch-up costs that you have to pay in order to prepare yourself for just the diligence aspects of, of a transaction. And so, it's, you know, it just becomes one of those things where it, it, you can't make the decision lightly, you have to be ready for that investment, and you have to be prepared that at the end of the day, it might not close successfully, and you hopefully will want to continue to operate your entity. You know, beyond that, like be as in its standalone form. Yeah. So I, I have a couple of anecdotes, and I I can't name names either. But I, I had two different um, game ideas kind of drop into my lap in the last month. Um, two people that I know who had ideas. One, the idea was three years old, and this woman had already given away stock in her company to a game developer that she randomly met, and she had already. She literally had half a dozen investors who never put any money in. She just gave people pieces of her idea because they all promised they could help her. And she's been working this idea for three years. Not a single line of code has been written. Nothing's happened. And she came into my office, and, and it's a brilliant idea. I, mean, I, re I looked at it, and I'm like, this thing is it's amazing. It's just I, I, I don't want to reveal it. So I put her in touch with Kevin because I thought Kevin at least can tell her what she's doing wrong, which is just about everything. And the other was a friend of mine who's got some money in the bank, I mean, millions, he's not, a, he's not a zillionaire, but who has another idea, a different idea, really great. I mean, this I could see this turning into a dozen games and just and being a little company. And he just came up with it in the last month or two, and he's done nothing, and I put him in touch with Kevin. And so Kevin's working with these two different people, one of whom has already gone so far down the path without any help, without any representation, I think she's screwed. I think she's boxed herself in and can't get out of the hole she's in because there are all these other people who have to prove anything they do and they want their piece and they put nothing in, her idea. The other guy has done nothing except talk to Kevin and we've got him a developer and, and yeah, you're gonna get in the hole. So, I mean, but can you, I, I think there's a lot of horror stories like that. And I, so I didn't mean to, to the better looking David. I didn't mean to suggest that the people who you guys have bought <laughs> are completely unsophisticated groups. You're not buying a company unless, they're, unless right. they have revenue and they're doing something. But as you pursue whatever product you're, you're developing, think about that. Think about where do I want to be in five years, 10 years, 20 years. I am very friendly with Steve Perlman at OnLive who invented QuickTime, started Web TV, sold over $600 million, started on live. And I remember the first time I talked to him about this, you know, it was like the two weeks before they, they revealed it. I said, what do you, what do you want to do? What do you want to accomplish? And he goes, I want to run a public company. So he's not selling. He wants to run a public company. Talked to Mark Pincus five years ago, you know, when Zynga was just starting, and he would have told you the same thing. I want to run a public company, and he's going to. So if that's what you want to do, that's a whole different skill set, and you need different representation. If you just want to take your idea, make a bunch of money, this is Angry Birds, and then sell the company, that's great too. And you know, I, I know they want to be public, but, but I'm sure if somebody, if somebody gives them enough money, they're gone. <coughs> I'm see an Angry Birds shirt back there. Yeah, but that's how it should be. And I think that, that you really need to think about what you want to be when you grow up, <clears throat> you know, and not just randomly go through life and say, I'm just going to make a great game. And that, unfortunately, is, to me, is what most developers are artists and they don't think about monetization, they think about making just the best thing possible. So, team, you, know, you, you guys have any horror stories or any success stories? Either way, on, just on what you've done that's really helped somebody either turn it around, that you, a mess that you've salvaged, or? Well, I, I would say the big thing that I, I see on the M&A, half my business has been on the public equity side, <coughs> and what is great about the IPO is it's a great mantra for rallying the troops um, as a company. Most companies don't go public, most get bought off, and that's the best outcome because it's, you know, people are out faster, there's, you know, it's cleaner, there's other things. But we used to always say it was like the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and my industry was the IPO, and, and that is higher profile. But the reason why it's good that you're starting to see some public equity activity and IPOs is there's a tendency if you're building something to flip. Um, you're not really building a company, you're building a concept or, or, or something that you're not really owning over a long period of time. And, and one of the things, and I'll tell you, I've heard this, big company, small company, all the way through on sell side. Uh, we've got this money losing operation, X, but you know, 
don't you think a buyer may want that and we're going to keep it open and I've always said it's the same thing and I don't care whether it's a you know a huge company or small companies you got to run your business like you're going to own it long term buyers don't want to they're buying you to solve a problem not to take on problems and it's just that's I think something so I would not get so focused on um, and this is you know focused on selling your company um, you always have to be in the mode and network and go to conference and do that stuff. But if you focus on building a great company, and I think Zynga, you know, Mark Pincus was laser focused on building a great company. I think, you know, those are the, I think there's a lot of examples. And most successful exits, most successful entrepreneurs are focused on that, not on just how do I get out quickly, but how do I make something big? And if they can convey that, you're in a better position when you're negotiating with a buyer. Um, you're in a better position when you're raising capital because that's really what everybody's looking for. So we've spent a lot of time talking about the importance of good advisors, and I think if you take anything away, and I know Patrick in the audience will agree, the guys on the panel will agree, is that you can have the best advisors in the world. If you have no alternatives, you have very little leverage. And if you have all the alternatives in the world, you have all the leverage in the world that you need. And you can get, if, if you're the owner of certain patents and the single type of solution, I'll pick on you, at GameStop, and you need it for the, he needs it for his e-commerce solution. It's not even a sale, it's a license. I, representing Mr. Licensor, which might be all of two guys, two girls, and the dog, the dog being the most important team member, and I don't want to sell my company, I can, construct a great license deal with Mr. Large Game Stuff. He might get angry, he might pound the table, he might mm -hmm. scream at me, but I can do that because I have alternatives. Because I, I could sell it to, you know, the, my license tech to Microsoft or to any other number of people. And if, if you take away one thing from this, your advisor should be able to spot and analyze when do you have good alternatives, when do you have bad alternatives, when do we need to generate alternatives. To me, most small companies often don't focus on a couple of things that are fundamental to drive their business. One of them is sales. They come up with great ideas and great vision and business development. And that's where someone like Kevin Dent, who is a business development person, consultant, can just overnight turn it around for you. Most people don't focus on when I am in 12, when I'm at that point, 12, 24, you know, 36 months out, what do I see as the alternatives? What, if I'm building this company, and as you said, Mark Pincus was laser focused, you know, what are my alternatives? Mark Pincus still can sell his company rather than go public. I mean, he could merge it with Time Warner and get a great valuation, not that they want to be in that business, but, but he has alternatives. And so I think that's the one thing that you really, as you build your company, you're always looking to maximize what your alternatives are to maximize your business value. And I guess my question is, when you guys look at potential targets, how do you assess them? Not to completely open up what your corporate and MA process is, but what drives you to certain people as opposed to others? What are the well, and, and perhaps we're, perhaps we're a little unusual in this regard, but. We have a very clear strategy that ha that has gaps. I mean, I think you know, in our case, where we are expanding dramatically into areas where we don't have historical and, and, and internal capabilities, it it, map, it it forms a pretty clear roadmap of yep. of those buy versus build kind of options. And if you have you know, if you're working against you know a window of opportunity within a marketplace, that skews the equation more towards inorganic or or buy options as opposed to build. So, you know, in our case, when we're looking for, we go to, we go to the marketplace or the of opportunities with a pretty clear list of these are the types of capabilities or these are the types of companies that we want to add to, you know, to our, to our, to our portfolio. And so, um, I mean, then, then though, that, that becomes the first stage. Then after that, I think that there is that strong focus from a cultural and execution perspective that just says, you know, to your to your point, we're looking for companies that are going to solve problems, not create problems, and we're looking for expertise that is very much complementary. 
to those that we, that we have internally. So the competence factor has to be pretty high because you know, there's, you're, 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 you're not just augmenting something that's internal, sometimes you're creating whole new capabilities. So there has to be a clear ability to execute within whatever you're requiring. So um, you know, I think that, that, and maybe that's not dissimilar from some of the other opportunities that you've seen, but you know, for, for us, you know, we have a pretty clear recipe that we're trying to do together. And I guess I would say, you know, as, the, as the lawyer who's often the advisor, and I, you know, I get it when people, you know, people call me up and send over the term sheet. They don't, they don't call me at the early stage usually for, for pre-planning. Um, build towards what you see, not just creatively, but strategically as opportunities out there. You know, a GameStop is going to be, have to, by the very nature, be in the digital business. So is Target, so is Best Buy, so is Walmart. Um, all of those, you know, companies have avowed publicly disclosed in their, in their public filings digital strategies. And you can, with very little research, find out what that is. And then you can talk to people like this and say, Kevin, I, I, I want to be doing deals with, with GameStop, with my solutions. Can you help me do that? Or David. Who's going to be buying in 12, 24 months? Um, that, that, you know, to me, it's be strategic and be tactical and, and pick your opportunities so you can develop the alternatives earlier rather than later. So I'd like to open up to questions if you have. Oh, go ahead, Kevin. So I just one little thing about all of this because we, all of the guys have addressed, you know, the, the sort of fields of aims and the elephant is literally and we've got the Rovio guys. That Creators, factory birds. Uh, here's the, the dirty little secret. Okay, Angry Birds is an amazing game. It was improbable, and like we're gonna have to wait a long time before we see that again. Okay, I'm sure there'll be more Angry Birds guys. I'm saying a new sort of idea that comes along. Okay, there's nothing wrong with not raising any money. There's nothing wrong with being just in your studio making your games putting them out there, okay? It's been now more than ever in the history of the video games industry. People can now envision two guys working in uh, just by themselves, okay? The, probably the best example is Gold Creative who did Pocket Cut. Uh, this is a game that's done about 22 million revenues. Uh, a few years ago I said to, to Dave, the CEO of Pocket Cut, I said, what's your, oh, Gold Creative, what's your ambition level? Where do you want to be in five years? And he said, well, Kevin, right now we're two people and a dog, okay? In five years' time, I want to be two people and a dog and maybe a BD person outside, okay? So he hired a lady called Jean Hatchers. She's going to be speaking later on today. She's really good. You should listen to her as well. Uh, so he just basically, he doesn't have any ambition to go outside and do anything other than do his game, he licenses IP out there, and you know he'll do the next version of Pocket God when he feels like it. Okay, he's got no ambitions to make a movie. Okay, he's done a comic book, he's done plush toys, he's done apparel, and when I say he, I mean his BD person has basically licensed that out. Okay, what I'm trying to get to here is that you don't have to raise money. Okay, you. I did a, an interview today with uh, Pocket, uh, Pocket Gamer, which is uh, a mobile gaming uh, site based out of the UK, and I basically said, you don't have to be, everyone expects to be the next Pocket, uh, or the next uh, Andy Burks, okay? Those guys did a phenomenal job. They deserve every success that they have. But the likelihood of everyone being an Angry Bird is uh, pretty tough, you know? Like, the statistics just don't match. So my point is, if you're making four hundred dollars a day on iOS from your game, be happy. Okay, just be happy. Iterate, make another game. Hopefully, you'll make another four hundred dollars a day. Like that's a lot of money to for a guy who's working in a studio that would normally make probably eighty grand, eighty-five grand working in the studio. You know, that's a living. You're feeding your family. There's something uh, honorable in that as well. You don't have to go out and raise money. 
So we're going to open up to questions. We don't have uh, a whole lot of time, but happy to, and you can direct the question to anybody in the panel. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is exactly what you guys can answer, but in terms of uh, trying to evaluate um, any company that you're looking to purchase, for example, process, you know, health of the company, the balance sheet, all that stuff is, is certainly something you're going to be able to evaluate. It, it, to what extent uh, should the person who uh, creates the IP and to what extent is the IP something that has to be sold or, you know, how can you evaluate IP as opposed to all the other things that are probably more easily valued? You, you understand what I mean? Yeah. I, I, IP is far, I mean, it's the hardest thing to value and it, it's just what a, a given buyer will pay. I mean, it really is, that's as much of an art um, as there is in valuation stuff. And it's always been like that, and that's across the board with that. So I guess my follow-up to that would be, how do you guys feel about the, the kinds of deals out there that uh, just about everything else that's easy, more easily valued is, is the deal that the IP is? I, the fundamental driver of valuation is growth. And, and um, whether it's allowing, you know, GameStop is making the moves. They, they've got a great business on a, on a legacy business, okay? But the growth, you know, <laughs> perception, reality, no, I'm just saying that the, the growth isn't what's driving them to continue. It's, you know, they, they've been getting hit on this before. It's like, well, we've got to move into areas of growth. And, and that's what's ultimately driving people to do a lot of this. Because the multiple applied to your earnings, and every public company, you know, is is valued on, on a multiple of their earnings. And every company that goes out, Zingle will be valued on a multiple of earnings. That multiple they apply will be based on growth. If a company stops growing, and this happened with eBay, this happened, but across the board, everybody, everybody then, has it. Then all of a sudden it goes down. And if you think of the impact, okay, it's a multiplier. So the impact of the valuation on a company, you can lose billions in market cap off of nothing, you know, you're just, your growth slows. You're still yeah. growing, but it's slow. Yeah. And so that is a real driver. And just, that's why, just, just to frame this, um, Zynga, if you look at their pro forma earnings and adjust for tax, and it's, it's probably going to go out at 50 times earnings. And uh, Netflix currently trades at 75 times earnings. Um, GameStop trades at something like eight times earnings. So, you know, the, the, the amount that you're coming Worth is really more a function of what the market perceives your future earnings are. And so the market is going to make a bet on Zynga that they're going to grow at 30 or 50 percent a year for a while. And they're making a bet on GameStop that they're not going to grow. And IP is what gives people comfort. So if your IP is Cabbage Patch Kids, people aren't paying a lot for it because they think it might be a fad. It's Guitar Hero. It's hard to sell Guitar Hero right now as an IP. But if you have IP that people think could be Angry Birds and be the next Angry Birds, and go from being a really casual, modest game to being a 50 or 80 million dollar property. Yeah. And, and one other thing, if your your contribution, your growth is phenomenal and it's going from, let's just use earnings, it's going from 3 million to 7 million, and Time Warner is looking at you, okay, it's irrelevant. Okay, so it's growth, but it's, it's around here. Yeah. I mean, that's where, you know, and that's why people sometimes, is small companies like, look, it's not going to move the needle in the same way. And what's going to be very interesting is, you know, almost all of Zynga's acquisitions before going public have been small. At some point, if they do feel like they're going to have to get real growth outside of their core business, because I think they, they actually feel like they have a good runway within the core business, so they're adding to it. Um, when they do the acquisitions, you know, doing mobile organically is likely not going to happen. Going to but if they're going to buy someone, you know, it's got to be scale. And, and that's where NG Moco got the big valuation. They didn't have a lot of revenue, but they were established. Yeah, relative. definitely in the business with scarcity value. How many companies with the, you know, those kind of revenues are mobile game publishers? And DNA decided we really want to be in mobile and we really want to be in the U.S. market. Tencent investing in uh, Riot Games, same thing. It just you know again, I I, I know Riot Games. They seem great to me, but. That kind of valuation. Well, Tencent said there's only a few guys who fit our strategy. They're very good. They're established. They have a lot of users. So it's not always IP. It could be your installed base of users. Yeah. Well, I guess I, 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 I follow, follow the question. Well, my question is like, as as someone who's on the the, the sell side, 
potentially. Yep. Let's say. Um, to what extent do you use? How, how would you recommend like trying to? Let me let me try and answer. Let me try and answer that because I've run a couple of corporate buy side M and A programs, and now I'm on the sell side advising people. We still do some buy side work, but but we were public record. We represented Chilingo on the sell side, and um, and and that was a good deal for everybody, um, and. Um, I think there are a couple of things, and there are different schools of thought, and, and I don't, it's sort of like uh, uh, doctrines within the, 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 the church. They're, they're all, different ones work for different people, okay? If you're representing an Israeli company, and it's, it's fascinating to me, they've all gone out, hired a good patent lawyer in Israel, patent prosecutor, and good patent people in the US, and they file a bunch of patents as broadly as they can, and they, they pursue a patent-centric strategy and that's how they because they have such a heavy tech focus and that's how they see that they'll get an uplift in their valuation in addition to people and growth and they view that as essential and it really comes out of a semiconductor back um, and in software patents you know you can have um, a lot of discussions around software patents as he knows <laughs> and I know having, having been through both the troll side and the other side. But I, I, and I think a lot of startups need to think about it, they may not be able to invest in it. But if you're in the content business and you're creating what you hope is going to be the next Angry Birds, um, you know, for God's sakes, invest the, in, you know, my patent, my, my trademark copyright partner who runs a bunch of portfolios will be horrified to say this. Invest the chump change in his in his work. Invest the five, ten, fifteen, twenty grand to get your copyright registrations and your trademark prosecutions and your all of that in place and filed and on file. That will create value. That will create value in the eyes of, of the buyer that you have your house in order. And the investor, by the way. And the investor. And it will matter to, to institutional investors and by that I mean the venture people. Um, and don't minimize in your mind the worth of the IP because every you've got to have growth you've got to have the story and that's one word we haven't used today but what I talked to David I think it was Thursday morning Thursday morning he, we were talking about Zika he said Pincus is going to be so focused on his story to the market and then he's going to have to face the issue of what will happen when his story has a hand. And, and, and that comment of what the story is, the story has to be complete for you on the sell side. It has to be we have the right people, we're properly organized, we have the right tech, we didn't go and build it ourselves, maybe we did a unit license, maybe we built it ourselves here where it was proprietary. And our, our content IP is well, well taken care of and well protected. We're not going to get sued by Rovio or EA or anybody else because we did, you know, do the proper trademark filings here and in Europe and one over in China. Um, we did our copyright registrations, and guess what? We even have a patent that might create value for you down the line. And you know, we we know that we we've, we've got an interesting patent. We did a patent search, and there's a prior. Get your house in order across the board. IP is a critical. I'll end with one story. One of my interesting deals where I had to sign the papers for someone was buying Red Storm. And I didn't want to buy that company. I didn't get the story. And finally the corp dev sat down and said to me, Dan, we're buying Tom Clancy's library by buying this company. And we don't have to pay a license. This is a huge IP steal. Now, needless to say, there's more to that overall story. <laughs> Many years later, several times. Later. But what drove that deal was not just the fact that Red Storm had gone from being an idea to being a growth story in the video game business really fast. And just like PopCap wanted to go public, and that was what management wanted to do, and yet the investors wanted to sell, and Ubisoft showed up in the chat. They had great IPs, 
And so don't minimize your IP and protect it properly. Yeah, sorry, just one, one last thing. Uh, make sure your investor or your shareholder ledger is clean. So I, no Irish investors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I have a, a war story from this week. So company A I went to their CEO and he was like saying, hey, we'd really like you to come on, on our board. And I said, okay. I said, uh, let me do some due diligence, look at their books. They looked okay. You know, I was a young star. Uh, then I looked at the shareholder later and I was like, um, right my friend, who's this fucker with 30%? I haven't met this guy, you know, I've, been, I've met everyone, but you haven't introduced me to this guy. And he said, oh, he was here for a month. Yeah. He was our CMO and he left. And I'm like, oh, so he didn't have the best in period? And he was like, oh, no, we, we were all friends, you know. And this, you would, you think that's unusual. I would love it to be unusual. It's <laughs> not, okay? I come across that so freaking often. It's unbelievable. Okay, so make sure you're shareholder, because otherwise, if I'm an investor and I see that, I'm going to say this guy's an idiot. Okay, he's an investor. Okay, but it happens quite often. Isn't that sort of why uh, Riot could only be sold for 10 cents? Nobody else would buy it. Yeah, there's a poison chalice. But the, the valuation was poison so high. Pills, right. it wasn't, wasn't Riot high? Relatively Riot didn't have to sell, and that's, you can always say no, right? And, 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 and actually, I, I think you're right. I mean, Tencent, I mean, is such a monster in the market, but they can have a chilling effect, just the same way that Microsoft or other Google can have that, where people can say, I, it's not worth spending all the time engaging, it will go to Tencent. I think tactically, you know, I'm sure they spend a lot of time positioning that, that no, there, there's others, but ultimately, you know, I've always said this, boards, companies can always say no. And, and I think that's where Tencent decided they needed to do it. They wanted to do it now. And if they were going to do it now, they were going to have to pay up. We, we, can, we can rally outside. I, I promise we went over time, and I don't want to. Okay, yeah. Oh. I don't want to crush it. We, we're, 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 you grab all of us out. No, we're, 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 we're headed to the over. So. Oh, we are? Okay. We're oh, we'll hang on. I thought we had time. I was kidding. No, well, we just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.